So what do you know about Stonewall? Well, I know a little bit of the history because I feel like we've done a little bit of a dive into mm-hmm. it in, in the past. Um, Stonewall is originally a private bar. It was a popular bar for the gay population of New York City. This was at a time when there were a lot of police raids on gay bars. And this was really kind of like the spark that led the gay rights movement. Um, it was really kind of like where everything sort of initiated in a big way um, for gay rights. Great. And what I knew about Stonewall up until today, it was like the the riot that like set gay history into motion. Modern day gay history. Modern day gay yeah. history. It also corresponded with the death of Judy Garland and like Oh, I didn't know that. Her she died and like RuPaul said this on his show on Drag Race, uh, that she had died and her wake had been earlier that day. Oh. So, like, there was this sort of correlation between those two oh, things. Oh, that's something I just learned right now. So, thank you. So, anyway, that is that is something that I knew. That brings us to today's Pride Mix. Today on Pride Mix, we're going to be looking at Stormy Delavere. But in order to do that, we need to shed some light on what's actually known about that night at the Stonewall Inn in New York's West Village. So, let's begin with the idea that gay rights started at Stonewall. Um, It's not accurate, and here's why. Uh, Stonewall happened in 1969. So long before this, there were many groups and organizations that were actually fighting for gay rights, which is kind of like what we hinted at in our cold open. Right, exactly. We say gay rights because that's the language they used at the time. There were many groups and organizations formed that were fighting for this. Examples include... Uh, the founding of the Mattachine Society, founded by Harry Hay in Los Angeles in 1951. In 1965, activists in Philadelphia peacefully took to Independence Hall on July 4th with signs to protest the treatment of homosexuals. Uh, they called these demonstrations annual reminders. And they actually did this like every year for many years right, right. on in Independence Hall. And mm-hmm. it was like silent and signs and like very somber. Mm-hmm. Um, in 1966, New York's chapter of the Mattachine Society organization, they organized what they called a sip-in at Julius's Bar to demand that gay people be publicly served by bar owners and also to be able to gather in public space because both of those things were legal at the time. Other things that were illegal at the time include cross-dressing. Sodomy in New York at the time was no longer a felony. It was now a misdemeanor. Well, because there were sodomy laws all across the country right. for a long period of time. Right. Um, yeah. And the sip in at Julius's was a way for everybody to kind of show up and just announce that they were gay at right. the same time to right. basically see what would happen. The demonstrations outside the Black Cat Bar in L.A. in 1967, which peacefully protested police brutality and discriminatory laws. Also, a demonstration in front of the Pentagon in Washington, D.C. around the same time to fight for gay people to be able to serve in the military. Also, there are many other examples, and we encourage you to do your research as well. And then there was the night at Stonewall Inn in June of 1969. And since that evening had gained some national media attention, activists and organizers chose to capitalize on the attention. Literally, they had like a meeting in November, like the monthly meeting in November. They were like, let's use these riots that happened at Stonewall Inn Mm -hmm. and like capitalize on what happened. They secured parade permits for the anniversary of... Uh, that day. They called this day the Christopher Street Gay Liberation Day. And they asked activists in all other major cities to participate as well. Uh, Many of them did, and some of them didn't. Uh, Apparently, San Francisco chose not to participate as many of the organizers did not want to commemorate what they called a riot. Uh, However, on the anniversary in 1970 was the first gay pride parade, and that has become a continued tradition. So... Stonewall certainly played an important role in the gay rights movement. It was the catalyst into gay liberation, but it is not the birth of the fight for gay rights. So um, everybody, let's say it together. Gay Gay history history did did not start start at Stonewall. Stonewall. We would like to cite our sources for this info and encourage you all to research as well. But specifically, we'd like to cite the LA Conservancy's article on the Black Cat Bar, the article 
The Stonewall Riots didn't start the gay rights movement by Gregor Matson, published on Chaster Daily. And before the Stonewall Uprising, there was The Sip In by Jim Farber, published in the New York Times. Real quick, let's talk about the Judy Garland connection. Um, even RuPaul mentioned this on Drag Race, which is what Dusty had said earlier. Some say, even some Stonewall veterans, that many gay people had attended Judy Garland's wake earlier in the afternoon and then had gone to Stonewall as a gathering place afterward. However, the only place where there was a published connection was only one periodical, and the article was entitled Too Much, My Dear, uh, by a right-wing journalist named Walter Troy Spencer. Here is what the beginning of the article reads, a trigger warning for any of our gay listeners. The combination of a full moon and Judy Garland's funeral was too much for them, Dick Neuweiler said the other day, assessing the cause of the Great Faggot Rebellion. It has been good for a lot of cracks and saloon gossip, but basically I find the Stonewall siege depressing. For a one or even two-nighter, it was a pretty entertaining floor show. The swishy cheerleaders, the one queen Salome dance in front of the advancing police line, but after a couple of nights, who needs all that tension? I sure don't want to have to run some gauntlet every night just to quietly slip into my friendly neighborhood saloon, end quote. Okay, so let's talk about this connection between Stonewall and Judy Garland. Okay, when RuPaul said this on his show, I was like, oh, I had never heard that before either. Mm -hmm. But I was like, I personally understand what it means to be like, obsessed with a female singer right you know that's amazing there are right. many we have we have many judy garlands today you know what i mean right right um but when i heard that i was like huh i don't know how, like if i would like associate those two things together right it seems like a thin connection and i mean mm -hmm. if you look at the source it's one republican leaning periodical oh, yeah, yeah. that seems to be pretty scathing in its review anyway oh, so clearly. i think it's it is a, an opportunity to kind of undermine this important movement oh um, yeah i think it like it kind of assumes that it's like gay people were so sad over judy garland that they decided to like start throwing stuff when like the police gave them a hard time right when and, they told them to stop singing. And it's like, yeah. no, no, this was a, literally a response to police brutality. Right. Was what Stonewall, that and night at Stonewall was. Harassment, right. police brutality, being arrested for being yourself. Right, exactly. So. So let's talk about the brick. Um, there are many things written down and said uh, that there is one person responsible for throwing the first brick. Uh, in order to talk about this, we have to talk about the nature of riots. Some people claim that Stonewall was a riot. Some people claim the word is inaccurate. Uh, they prefer rebellion or uprising. Uh, but what we do know is that there were a lot of people there that night and things were definitely thrown. Uh, no one really knows where the bricks came from. Yeah, they do. All, it is sort of like universally agreed that it was a violent evening. Some say that there was a construction site next door. Some say that they had never heard that before. Some say that rocks were thrown that they found on the streets. Some say it was a shot glass. But it is safe to say that it was big, involved a lot of people, and even the people who were there can't really identify a defining moment that incited everything. And to that end... Does it really matter? Does it really matter? Does it really matter exactly? Like, you know what I mean? Like, uh, when it's a giant group of people together, really, it's like the group did the thing. There's not like one person in the group that made the group suddenly turn into something else. Right. It's you not a school I mean? project, you know, where right. the type A personality takes the lead. Exactly. <laughs> right. Now, all that said, um, there are a number of accounts that... According to the New York Times, a gender nonconforming person in a physical fight with the police that night screamed out, what are you doing? Why are you just standing there? Why don't you do something? So this person was literally being beaten up by the police and then cried out these words. And many do credit that moment as an inciting incident. And some people say that that was Stormy DeLavere. Uh, we want to also credit the New York Times piece of video journalism entitled The Stonewall You Know is a Myth and That's Okay by Shane O'Neill for the facts you heard from the previous segment. Now, the New York Times refers to 
the person in the fight with the police as a gender non-conforming person. And I think the intention behind that was to say that this person presented androgynously. And based on all of our research, Stormy DeLavere identified as a lesbian who used she, her pronouns. She is often cited for throwing the first punch at Stonewall, I say with air quotes, like um, live in, in studio here. Right. In Studio 6H. <laughs> in Studio 6H. And is also sometimes referred to as the Rosa Parks of the gay rights movement. She was born in New Orleans in 1920. Uh, she celebrated her birthday on December 24th. Her mother was black and her father was white. She began working as a singer. She said that she tried to do the proper thing and wear women's clothes on stage and women's clothes on the street and got picked up twice for being a drag queen. In 1955, she began working as the MC of the Jewel Box Review, which was this traveling show. And it was billed as, quote, an unusual variety show. She dressed as a man, as the MC, and the rest of the cast, who were all men, dressed as women. She said that there were, quote, 25 men and me. This was like the moment that made her a drag king icon. To speak on the uncertainty if Stormy was the person that people remember, Lisa Canastrassi, uh, one of her legal guardians and also the owner of the bar, Henrietta Hudson's, that is a staple of Manhattan's West Village, said in an interview with the New York Times, nobody knows who threw the first punch, but it's rumored that she did. And she said she did. She told me that she did. She says, the cops hit me and I hit them back. This led to a fight with the cops where she supposedly proclaimed this famous phrase, why don't you do something? And when speaking of that night, she emphatically says that it was not a riot, but rather, quote, a rebellion, an uprising, a civil rights disobedience. Two weeks after the rebellion, she helped to form the Stonewall Veterans Association. She was active in the organization, serving as chief of security and ambassador and later vice president. She lived at the Chelsea Hotel in Manhattan for decades and became a bodyguard for wealthy families during the day and a bouncer, though she didn't really like that term and much preferred, and this is a quote from her, a babysitter of my people, all the boys and girls at several lesbian bars in the West Village at night, including Cubby Hole and Henrietta Hudson's. Which are both great bars. And when bars open back up, you have to go to those bars. So she had no tolerance for what she called, quote, ugly, meaning rudeness or bullying or behavior that she did not like for her, quote, baby girls. She was known for walking around the West Village and keeping an eye out on everybody. This is another quote from Lisa Conestrasi from Henrietta Hudson. She literally walked the streets of downtown Manhattan like a gay superhero. She was not to be messed with by any stretch of the imagination. In 2000, she received the Gay Lifetime Achievement Award from Senior Action in Gay Environment, or SAGE. DeLavere was well known as a regular, leading the annual New York City Gay Pride Parade with the Stonewall veterans and the historic 1969 Cadillac convertible Stonewall car, which she called Stormy's Baby. On June 7, 2012, Brooklyn Pride Incorporated honored her at the Brooklyn Society of Ethical Culture. She was also featured in a film directed by Michelle Parkerson called Stormy, the Lady of the Jewel Box. On April 24th, 2014, she was honored by the Brooklyn Community Pride Center for her, quote, fearlessness and bravery. After a long struggle with dementia, she died in her sleep on May 24th, 2014, in a Brooklyn nursing home. She was 93 years old. As she said in a 2001 documentary short called A Stormy Life, I'm a human being that survived. I helped other people survive, end quote. All of the information about Stormy DeLavere in today's Pride Mix came from the sources we listed in the episode, also from them.us, blackpast.org, Huffington Post, New York Times, and the New York Public Library. This has been Pride Mix by Gay is at the National Parks, the podcast. We're here to remind you to pride early and pride often, and that resilience is always out there. Gay is at the National Parks was created and is hosted by Dustin Ballard and Michael Ryan. 
To see images from this episode, follow our Instagram at gaze at the national parks. To contact us, email us at gaze at the national parks at gmail.com and visit our website, gaze at the national parks.com. That's gaze, G A Z E. All original artwork featured on our website and on Instagram is by Michael Ryan. All original music was written by Dave Seaman and performed by Dave Seaman, Mariella Klinger, and Sean Sklios. Our music producer is Skylar Fortgang. This episode was edited by Dustin Ballard. Thank you.